Hi, I'm Terry Schuster. I've been on the board of Beyond Pesticides for 33 years now. <laughs> Coming out of our work on glyphosate, other antibiotics, and organic production, we looked for a speaker today who could uh, make connections between the microbiota in the soil and the microbiota in our gut it makes up 90 or that makes up 90 percent of our bodies. We found Dr. David Montgomery who's a MacArthur Fellow and a professor of geomorphology at the University of Washington and the author, author of several books including Growing a Revolution and the Hidden Half of Nature, uh, both of which are available for sale at the registration desk. Um, Dr. Montgomery will be available to sign those uh, during lunch. Um, I'd like to introduce now David Montgomery. Okay. Uh, Terry, thank you for the invitation. And thank uh, you all for coming here and for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, I'm a geologist by background, and my wife and co-author on this book that I'll be talking about today is a biologist. And so part of what I want to get across is why would people like us who are trained to study in the more traditional natural history disciplines of things we can actually pick up and look at and see and feel for ourselves, why would we write a book about microbes? But the first thing that I need to do is ask, is anybody uh, live tweeting this? Because if so, please send a note to dig to grow that I made it. So why would Ann and I write a book about microbes? And this was very much a collaborative effort, as you'll see as I try and go through what it is that we learned along the way. Uh, and the real message is that the way that we understand the microbial world is really going through a revolution in thought that Ann and I think is really akin to a genuine, bona fide scientific revolution. Uh, the way that we are thinking about how microbial communities now interact with plants and with people and are essential to their health and well-being is completely shifting the way that we've thought about and looked at how we um, interact with the microbial world in ways that has fundamental implications, we argue, for both agriculture and medicine that relate to the themes that you all uh, in this group are very interested in, in terms of the application of broad-spectrum biocides as routine measures in both agriculture and medicine. And as we got into researching this book about sort of the stars of the microbial world um, and their interactions not only with each other but other organisms, we really realized that there's a big scale change in the way that we think about our relationship to nature that's going on that's centered in the microbial world and the microscopic world. Now, the title of the book, The Hidden Half of Nature, is actually meant to be taken literally. Because if we look at the range of scales in the way that a geologist, you know, we like sort of uh, logarithmic scales, factors of 10 across things. So from down here at the nanometer scale of DNA up to our scale at the meter scale that we live in, uh, each of these is a jump in a size of a factor of 10. And you'll notice where the boundary between the microscopic world, the invisible world, and the visible world lies. It's halfway through the scale. There's as much of a range in size in the microscopic world of nature as there is in the world of nature that we know from the size of amoebas up to us. And if you actually weighed up all the microbes on this planet and you compare that to the weight of all the plants and animals on this planet, they're about equal. And there's about a nonillion microbes on this planet. Now, how, anybody know how big a nonillion is? I didn't, I had to look it up. <laughs> it's a one followed by 30 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. How many zeros is that? That's enough that if you took all the bacteria, all the microbes in the world, and laid them end to end, and it takes 50,000 of them to go around just my thumb, if you laid them all end to end, they would reach the nearest star and back. Now, I'm not talking about Sol, our star. I'm talking about Alpha Centauri and back. In other words, microbes, if they ever got organized, could actually get off this planet before we could. So how is it that we came to actually recognize and get interested in and look at this microscopic world. Well, it may seem like a bit of a non sequitur, but we bought a house in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> and if that is, uh, well, basically, it came with a lawn, an old growth Seattle lawn. It was a lawn planted in 1918. Nothing much had been grown uh, there after that. I thought it was actually a perfectly fine lawn. The dog liked to chase balls on it. I could get the grad students over for a croquet once a year. But my wife is a gardener. 
Anne viewed this as her garden to be. And it's one of the main reasons we bought this house is that she wanted to actually transform it from something other than that lawn. And so when we pulled off that lawn, we discovered that we actually had this incredibly rich, dark, fertile soil. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> we had glacial till. Seattle's a town that was overrun by a glacier that scraped off bits of British Columbia, bulldozed it down to, to where we live in Seattle, and then overran it with a, a mile-high pile of ice, about three times the height of the Space Needle if you're looking for scale. Um, and it was basically nature's concrete. We didn't find a single worm in this soil when we pulled that lawn off. No macroscopic life forms. Now, I'm sure there were some microbes in there, but we'll get back to that a little later. And I, 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 just, I would like to call your attention to the, the uh, roof of our neighbor's house back there in the back, because it'll come back in a few slides. But the real star here is that we realized that we didn't have soil, we had dead dirt. Now, when you think about what is it that actually makes for rich, fertile soil, it is the marriage of geology and biology. You'd think that people like Ann and I would have understood this. <laughs> but I didn't think to dig a soil pit in our yard when we bought the house, and neither did she. So we, we were faced with this when uh, we started to try and jet turn that yard into a garden. And we realized that we had the geology. We had all those bits of Canada that had been scraped down to our way. But we didn't have the biology. The organic matter content, for those of you who are into these things, in the soil in our yard when we started was less than 1%. This led us, and I should say more correctly, it led Anne to think that what we really needed to do was add a lot of organic matter to the yard. And so she started what we call in the book her organic matter crusade, basically going to every place that we could get organic matter, bringing it in and um, putting it on as compost uh, or mulch in the yard and trying to rebuild our soil. At the time, I was writing a book about the way that agricultural practices had destroyed civilization after civilization from degrading their soil, and it was a revelation to me as to how fast you could actually revive soil. And it was happening right under my nose in my own yard as, as Anne was uh, indulging in her um, uh, grand experiment of bringing life back to the yard. This shows you her pruning shears, and this is the, the soil pit that we actually ended up digging in the yard about five years into her organic matter crusade. And you'll notice the wood chips and the, and the mulch that she was layering on the surface of the soil. She was not a digger, she was a composter and a mulcher. And you'll notice that we have glacial till down here at the bottom, and you'll notice how the plant roots go down to the till and they go sideways. They're not going down into the till. But notice what's in between. About two inches of actually halfway decent soil that formed in about five years. Now, if you actually look at the geological literature at how fast soils form, you get rates that are measured in tenths of a millimeter a year. Here we have two inches in five years. And this was not from breaking rocks down to form more soil. It was forming good soil out of the geology that was already there by adding the biology. And it started me thinking, oh, well, what if the key to soil restoration isn't the way a geologist usually thinks about it in terms of making more soil from rocks? but it's actually turning the stuff at the surface into more of a fertile soil by adding the biology. And uh, if you, this is about the same time as that last uh, photo um, that I just showed you of the soil, and it remind, reminds me to, tell, to basically say that you know, the, the changing our soil transformed the yard above ground too. We ran into an explosion of plant life. The neighbors behind are, are hardly visible now, and this slide is a few years old now. We can't even see those, pe those people anymore, and they're lovely people. But <laughs> But we really would rather not share their child, you know, their, their whole life uh, in our backyard. So, but what was really happening? What happened? Why was this organic matter crusade? Why was adding uh, dead material, essentially, to the surface of the soil, leading to an explosion of life both above and below ground that we describe in much more detail in the book than I'll have time to go into today, because there's a whole second half of the talk that I, I want to get to. But basically, that compost that we were adding at the surface was being consumed by microbes, bacteria and fungi, the sort of the smallest creatures in the, the soil food web, which were then being in turn consumed by larger, larger creatures, which are consumed by larger creatures. And we were cycling organic matter into this underground ecosystem in ways that, that um, led us to learn things that frankly quite surprised us and started us on this view of a completely different relationship of the natural world to human societies. Uh, and this just shows you a few of those characters in this, um, uh, in this story. A little clump of bacteria over here, um, some 
fungi over here connected by their tiny little root-like hyphae to the root hair of a plant. These are the smallest scale creatures that, are, that were in our garden that were responsible for breaking down that organic matter. And one of the things that, that Ann and I both noticed when she started her composting and mulching activities is we would basically lay a good bed of, of mulch down in the fall and it'd be virtually gone come the spring. And initially we were starting to think, you know, is somebody coming into our yard at night and taking all our good stuff? No. <laughs> They weren't. Um, you know, and it turns out our neighbors are actually quite happy to have us go rake up their leaves and bring them back to our yard. Um, but still, this stuff was disappearing and breaking down. But we, you know, we're enough of scientists to realize that it wasn't just disappearing. It was being transformed. And the microbial life, the bacteria and fungi, were the things primarily responsible for that transformation. And they turn out to be very nutrient rich, rich in nitrogen, rich in phosphorus, and rich in the micronutrients that all life forms need. Why? Well, because they're breaking down organic matter that used to have those nutrients, that used to be a living matter. Um, and what happens when nematodes and microarthropods then graze on and consume these smaller creatures? Well, we all know that when you eat something, it comes out later in a transformed state that may not be quite as desirable to us, but actually can be fairly good fertilizer. So when you think about what is happening from, uh, with these small creatures in the soil food web, I like to think of them as tiny livestock that are manuring the soil from the inside out. And when you start thinking that way, you start thinking about, oh, well, we're, by adding all that organic matter to the yard, we're basically feeding our grazing animals that are then being, in turn being grazed on, sort of a two-step uh, soil food web, and that that was essentially building up the nutrient levels in the soil. You know, and to be honest, to a geologist, that was not completely sort of new thinking. That's, that's systems thinking we're fairly accustomed to. But we, we started to look into things and learn some things in researching this book, um, that really quite surprised me. And one of them is that we tend to think, you know, centers on what happens in the rhizosphere, that zone around the root system of a plant that is incredibly rich with life, uh, and it's one of the most life-dense zones on the planet. And you start to think, well, okay, well, why is that? And I was quite surprised to learn that roots are actually two-way streets. When I took soil science a few decades ago um, in graduate school, I was basically taught that, that plant roots were like straws. They bring up water and the nutrients contained in them that have been derived from rocks and bring them into plants. But it turns out the plants actually push out into their soil up to 30 or 40 percent of the carbon and the carbon-rich compounds that they can manufacture with their monopoly on photosynthesis. They'll push that stuff out of their roots and into the soil. Now, why would a plant do that? How many of you take 30 to 40 percent of your income and just go throw it on a street corner somewhere? <laughs> You know, if you think about it in those terms, it's kind of an utterly irrational thing for a plant to do. And yes, I know plants don't have brains, but they do communicate, so we could we talk about that all day. But the, what is it, why would plants be essentially pushing out such nutritious material, what Elaine Ingham likes to call the equivalent of cakes and cookies, into the soil? It's to feed the, the life that's living in the rhizosphere. And why would a plant do that and maintain that over the entire sort of evolutionary history of plants? Because if you go back and look at the very first plant fossils from 400 million years ago, they have mycorrhizal fungi intertwined with their roots. This has been going on as long as there have been plants. Why would they do that? Well, it's not because most of the microbes are pathogens. <laughs> that would be an evolutionary dead end. It's, it's because they're basically feeding life forms in the soil that provide benefits to the plants. And so and I learned to see the rhizosphere, this life-dense zone uh, around the roots of plants, as what we call a biological bazaar where microbes and plants trade nutrients, metabolites, and exudates. So if you blow up uh, the area around a root or root hair of a plant, this thing's sort of coming down the middle here, what's happening is this purple zone uh, in the rhizosphere is where you have a high concentration of bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi connecting with the plants. Most of those exudates that come out of the plant <coughs> roots only make it a millimeter or a centimeter out into the soil before they're consumed. It's rapidly eaten, and what happens to things that are get eaten? They get transformed into metabolites, the byproducts of some living organism. And so what those bacteria are pushing out into the soil in, in uh, their metabolites are things like plant growth promoting hormones. They're compounds that actually, other compounds that have, are very nutrient dense, um, they're helping to dissolve the materials out of the soil and get them then back into the plants. But why would bacteria make plant growth hormones? This is like 
one kingdom of organism creating something to help another. It's a classic example of a symbiotic relationship. The plants are helping to feed the microbes, the microbes are helping to nurture the growth, and it turns out the health of the plants. Mycorrhizal fungi that are connecting out into the soil turn out to be going out and uh, excavating things like phosphorus or manganese or iron from the soil, bringing it back, trading it to, to the plants in exchange for their a cut of the photosynthetic harvest. Um, when Ann and I learned this, we were like really quite surprised that these kinds of relationships that have developed in the rhizosphere seem to be every bit as complex and evolutionarily fine-tuned as the relationships between plants and pollinators above ground. But we haven't known about them because they're occurring in this invisible world, microscopic world, and they're happening below ground, the sort of the double hidden nature of the hidden half of nature. Um, but we were even more surprised when we started looking into some of the other effects that happen in the relationship between plants, their roots, and the microbes living in the rhizosphere. Uh, for example, when some insect herbivores snack on uh, your favorite plant or a crop, that plant will push exudates out into the soil that will feed that are tailored to feeding the growth of very particular microbes and, uh, or microbial communities that will then produce very particular exudates that are taken up back up by the plant and can pr produce compounds that taste bad to that particular insect. This is really fine-tuned evolutionary relationships for that to happen. Um, this kind of thing is, is why Anne and I ended up writing this book. I wish I'd been taught this in grad school, let alone, let alone as an undergrad. It's utterly fascinating. And most of this 30 years ago well, we didn't understand the mechanisms. We didn't have the technology to actually study the connections and to establish that it's not just sort of wishful thinking about symbioses. The, the modern science that has been coming out in the last couple decades has nailed these relationships as at the cutting edge of science, even though they're very similar in terms of their broad implications for some of the things that Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour were proposing in the 1930s and 1940s. The science is finally catching up with some of the insights of the early pioneers of organic agriculture. And so what does this mean in terms of how we think about uh, uh, plant health and a plant diet? Well, it means that if you're thinking about what Ann and I call the fertilizer diet, if you provide a plant with most of the macronutrients that, that, that it needs, the N, P, and K that you usually find in the label of a bag, uh, basically you, they don't, those plants won't put as much energy into creating an extensive root system, be, and they turn into what we like to call couch potato crops. Um, <laughs> because, and think about it, you're basically providing them with the stuff they need for growth, but if the system that they rely on to promote their health and their defensive capabilities comes through the micronutrients that they get or the metabolites that the microbes in the soil produce, when you feed them a heavy diet of macronutrients, if they don't invest in that root system to put the exudates out into the soil to recruit the microbes that make the beneficial microbial compounds, they're getting a heavy dose of macronutrients and a light dose of beneficial microbial metabolites. On the other hand, so plants that are grown in soils that are rich in organic matter will grow extensive root systems, put out lots of um, exudates, and essentially recruit microbial allies. Um, that's a recipe for plant health. Now, what does that sort of soil life diet look like? It turns out, and this is again partly how, how Ann and I got into this, is it looks a lot like the kind of thing that Ann did to our yard in adding you know, our composted coffee grounds. We have a surplus of them in Seattle. Um, <laughs> not quite exporting them yet, but we're, we're working on it. Um, our leaves, wood chips. Um, it's basically trying to bring back the biology to feed the, the, the subsurface biology that is the other half of fertility in fertile soils. Now, at about the point that we, were discover we were, had sort of realized that there's this incredible microbial world going on underneath in the soil in our yard and that we'd figured out quite inadvertently that a, a very effective way to bring it back to fertility and watched the transformative effects on both the life in our yard and, um, and the development of our soil, we got thrown a curveball because we, here we were starting to think that the microbial world is this really neat symbiotic world in terms of what was happening in our yard. And then Anne was diagnosed with a microbial caused cancer. And this was a very serious event in our lives, obviously. Uh, and thankfully now she's just passed her five year anniversary of being cancer free. So it's an episode that we hope is well and truly behind us. Yeah. 
But that episode also started Anne thinking very strongly about what is it that actually supports health, and particularly the human immune system. Because it, with an event like cancer in your life, you start thinking about, well, what, what are the things that we could do to really bolster the effectiveness of our immune system to try and make sure we don't have any future episodes along those lines? So while we were thinking that the microbial world was this incredibly symbiotic thing, we got thrown this curveball that reminded us that not all microbes are on our side. There are very bad microbes in this world. And it led us into thinking about the human microbiome and its relationship to our immune system. And this is an area of science that's been exploding. You can know these are just number of publications since 2000 to a couple of years ago. You'll notice an exponential uh, growth curve. It keeps going up. Just the number of papers and interest in the human microbiome has obviously exploded in the last couple of years. And this led Anne and I to look into the relationship, its relationship to the human immune system and human health. And this has led to something I never thought I would ever be doing, which is standing in front of an audience and talking about the human colon. <laughs> now, basically a little geography here. Uh, <laughs> This is the lumen, we all have one. Uh, it is the, this is the center of your colon, if you cross section the colon, because uh, it turns out that most of the human immune system, some 80% of your immune cells, occur in the lining of the colon, just outside the colon wall. It's also, the colon is also where 80% of your microbiome lives. And what is your microbiome? It's the in, in indigenous microbes that, the, that live within you, your endemic microbial community uh, that live on and within you. And when we started looking into um, uh, immunology journals, and we, and we started to run across wording that talked about the mucus layer that lines the lining of your colon as an exudate that your colon wall cells produce and push out into the lumen, we started recognizing a very similar set of terms in both the, the gastroenterology literature and in the soil literature. And these things do come back together in the end. Um, because why is it that your colon lining would be producing exudates that actually support and feed a fair number of the microbes in your microbiome? It's starting to sound a little bit like what plants do. And so to, to basically understand the connection to the human immune system, you have to dive into what's happening across your colon lining. And it turns out that your colon lining is one cell thick, one cell separates the inside of you inside of you from the outside of you inside of you. Um, and so if we look at a cross section from the lumen uh, down into the inside of your colon wall, there's this mucus layer and there's microbes living both in the lumen and in the mucus, you know, 80% of your microbiome. Uh, and it turns out that there's these immune cells, dendritic cells, that are kind of shape-shifting shape amoebas in the sense that they can extend an arm stick it between the cells that line your colon, that one cell thick barrier, and they go out into the lumen or the mucus and they grab a sample of something. And they bring that sample back inside and share it with T cells uh, that are other cells in your immune system. And what are those samples? Those samples, if you've ever been to an allergist or talked in the immunology world, they're called antigen. Those dendritic cells will sample those, those microbes, bring their, their, their pieces of them, their antigen back, show them to T cells, and T cells are essentially major players in your immune system, but they are inactive most of the time. What it takes to activate a T cell, so it will do its job in ways that I'll talk about in the next slide, is it takes a dendritic cell bringing it the right antigen to fit like a lock and key with a receptor on a T cell, and each T cell is tailored for a very particular antigen. And when the dendritic cell brings it and gives it to it, that T cell gets activated. Otherwise, they just sit around in an inactive state and they're not really doing anything. So how do you, so it turns out that dendritic cells sampling microbes in your colon and in the colon lining will bring them back, activate T cells, and they do it in two different ways. We're used to thinking about our immune system as a system that goes after pathogens and kills them kind of like a paramilitary organization living within us. <laughs> but it turns out that there's two kinds of T cells that get activated by this mechanism. Some are pro-inflammatory. So if, if, if you have a pathogen or some other kind of thing that your immune system wants to, well, certain microbes that they get sampled, they activate T cells that trigger inflammation. 
Other T cells sample different antigen that when they trigger, they quell inflammation. They're anti-inflammatory. And in the classic way of thinking about our immune system, we just think about them as things that would trigger inflammation because inflammation is the process through which our body does remodeling. It goes and takes out cells we don't want there. Um, but like all remodeling projects, there's always incidental damage. Something gets broken. You don't want inflammation to be happening all the time. You want, if you don't need inflammation to be combating some kind of malady, you want inflammation to be turned off, to be quelled. And this idea that the regulation of your immune system to quell inflammation is dictated in part by microbes that are living in your gut is a completely new way of looking at the immune system and it also leads us to a completely new way at thinking about and looking at what we eat. Now if you look at the, what has changed over the course of the 20th century in terms of infectious and chronic diseases, there's a relationship here that, is gonna, uh, that we're going to try and get at the heart of. If we look at what's happened in terms of infectious diseases since the Second World War, they've really dropped dramatically. And why? Well, obviously antibiotics came into the play in, in that era. Uh, great increases in public sanitation happened in that same era as well. The development of vaccines and that their widespread use happened. Infectious diseases have gone through the floor in the last couple of human generations. But at the same time, rates of chronic disease have gone through the roof. So what's happening? With that, there's a hypothesis that researchers in the microbiome world um, have been investigating that's in great part based on that sort of teeter-totter balance of your pro- and anti-inflammatory immune cells that relate to what's happening in your gut. And that hypothesis is, are we missing some of our microbes? Are those mic are, have our microbial communities in our gut changed enough that our that the puppeteers, if you will, that have been running our immune system are actually misfiring or getting bad information. If you think about our immune system not so much as a police force and more as an intelligence arm, have we been getting bad intelligence for the last few decades in terms of what our body should do in relation to inflammation? And this is a hypothesis that's being pursued uh, by many researchers around the world. A lot of the results so far are correlative and not have, and have not established causal links, but there's a whole bunch of maladies for which causal links are starting to be established. And everything, every disease, up, every malady up here on the screen is one in which people have hypothesized and demonstrated correlative effects, and some of them have demonstrated causative effects. And I noticed there's an article that came out, I think, a couple days ago where you could add Parkinson's to the list. So what is it that might have happened to our microbiome? that could have led to such um, to serious proposals to investigate the idea of very widespread effects. Well, you know, what about what we eat? I mean, we know about changes in antibiotics after the Second World War and how that, they might affect the human microbiome shouldn't be much of a mystery. Broad spectrum antibiotics kill microbes broadly. Um, but what about what we eat? To understand the connection of diet with the human microbiome, we need to think a little bit about the human digestive tract. So I'm going to take you on a field trip uh, through the human digestive tract, and we're going to start up here at the stomach where there's hardly any bacteria, you know, one to ten per milliliter of fluid. It's an incredibly acidic environment. What happens there? Well, things are supposed to be dissolved. So food will come in, you start to dissolve it. In the small intestine, the, the the compounds that we have the enzymes to break down get absorbed. And those are things like proteins, like simple sugars, um, fats. They'll get absorbed in the small intestine. And there's more microbes there than there is in the stomach. But it's not until you get down to the colon that you start getting numbers in the hundreds of millions to trillions of microbes. Most of your microbes are living in your colon. And like all organisms, they need to eat. And what do they eat? Most of those microbes are eating whatever doesn't get absorbed by you through your digestive tract. That tends to be whole plant foods, complex carbohydrates. We have the enzymes to actually dissolve simple sugars, fats, and proteins for the most part, but we only have 23,000 protein-coding genes. If you add the protein-coding genes of our microbiome in our gut, you get up to over you know, several million genes. We and what do those uh, microbes living in our colon do with those whole plant foods that get down there with those complex carbohydrates? They ferment them 
we basically have an onboard fermentation tank um, called our colon. And it's the microbes that live within it that are essentially living off of the part of our diet that actually makes it down to what we like to think of as the tranquil grazing pastures for the microbes in our colon. Um, so what happens if we have a diet that does not have much in the way of complex carbohydrates? You're basically starving what's down in your colon. Now, what's happened to the human diet in the last 100 years or so in the, in the developed world? Well, we've changed our carbohydrate consumption. If you look at uh, uh, total carbohydrate consumption um, in grams per day from 1910 to 1997, it hasn't changed much since then, you'll notice that we had a high carbohydrate uh, consumption but a high fiber content. And what is another word for complex carbohydrates? Fiber. It's what your doctor would call them um, or your nutritionist would call it. And so carbohydrates come in simple forms, sugars. Uh, well, sugar, both are sugars. They're simple sugars and there's complex carbohydrates or fiber. We had a high carbohydrate, high fiber diet early in the century. A lot of changes happened during the century, but in, late in the, the 20th century, our carbohydrate component of our diet went back up. So that's about the same as it was early in the 20th century, but the form is different. We're eating simple sugars, not um, complex carbohydrates. And why is that? Well, twofold, the processing of grains has greatly reduced um, um, the complex carbohydrates in our diets and also the great increase in just simple sugars being added to everything. Um, so if you're wondering what does this all look like, well, we wanted to put at least one picture in that shows microbes dining on a banquet table of fiber. And this actually is from the human gut, um, and, but it could just as easily be a photograph from the garden. You know, if I hadn't told you and made you guess, I don't know what proportion we would have gotten. But there are, the one message we want to uh, convey is that there are really strong parallels in what's happening in terms of the relationship between the microbial world out in, there, in agricultural fields in the garden and within the garden of our own gut. So why, how does this matter to our own health? Well, I'll try and drive it home here, where if you have all these different fiber sources, of which there's lots of different varieties, lots of different names for, but the basic idea are complex carbohydrates that are coming from whole plant foods. Those get into your colon, they get consumed by the microbiota uh, within your colon, your microbiome, and they then produce their own metabolites. A lot of them produce fatty acids like acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And it turns out, I'm going to focus just on butyrate. Why? Well, what feeds the cells lining your colon wall? You know, most of, this, of our cells in our body are fed by our blood. Our colon lining is mostly fed. It gets most of its energy from the butyrate that's produced by microbes living in your gut. And those microbes depend on a diet of fiber. If they don't get enough butyrate, what happens is that the gaps between the cells start to grow because the cells shrink. And as you might imagine, you, it would not be crazy to posit that that might be linked to something called a leaky gut. So what happens when butyrate, uh, well, when, when T cells sample that butyrate, bring the antigen back and show it to, the, well, the dendritic cells sample it, bring it back, show it to T cells, it, it activates T regulatory cells. Those were the kind of T cells that quell inflammation and that basically blocks an inflammatory response. So here we've got all the sort of pieces connected between our diet and our, the inflammatory response in our bodies, the way our immune system is working. And it's mediated greatly through the role that microbial metabolites play in our gut. So where does this leave us in terms of thinking about the human diet? Well, if we think about what's happening with the Western diet, we've got, um, it's rich in simple carbohydrates, so we got a big arrow there. So you're getting a lot of stuff that's being um, uh, absorbed in our bodies through the small intestine, but you're really not putting a whole lot of fiber down into the colon, so you're getting a low dose of these medicinal microbial metabolites. And butyrate is just one of many compounds that the microbiota in our colons are actually making. There's estimates at 30 to 40 percent, if not more, of the metabolites that are, of the compounds circulating in our blood are metabolites from microbes in our colons. So you could think, we like to think of our microbiota, um, our microbiome as microbial alchemists. They're transforming that fiber into beneficial um, metabolites. 
On the other hand, if we think about something that, that Anne has termed the inner garden diet, and she got to name it because she's the gardener, um, it, you know, it can be a modest form in terms of, of simple uh, carbohydrate consumption, but it produces a, a lot of medicinal microbial metabolites, things that could actually be very useful in thinking in terms of preventive medicine. So what does that look like? Well, you kind of know what it looks like. A lot of whole, pl whole, whole plant foods in your diet. Some kind of a protein source, you can satisfy yourself on how you'd want to do that. Unprocessed whole grains are a great source of fiber as well. Um, but the key thing, and the thing that transformed our diet uh, after we did this research, was thinking that, oh, we really need to feed our microbes first. You know, I now think of after I've fed my microbes enough of a, of a whole uh, plant food based diet, then I can go have dessert or I can have you know, a burger or whatever I, wanna, or whatever I might want to eat. But the idea of prioritizing feeding your microbial crew is actually really crucial for health. Now, this also led Ann and I to um, sort of the revelation that transformed the way that we framed and wrote The Hidden Half. Because when we wrote, started writing The Hidden Half in Nature, we thought we were writing a book about restoring soil and restoring our yard. And we ended up devoting half of it to, to the human microbiome. Why? Well, when you look at these two systems, the human gut and the root system rhizosphere of a plant, you realize that they're very similar, but inside out. You take, you take your colon and turn it inside out, it's not all that different from the root system of a plant, do the opposite, you get kind of the same thing. And this is in terms of how the, mi the microbial communities in those organs are actually interacting to promote the health of the host. They're basically assisting with nutrient acquisition, the microbes in the soil are, are really helping to bring micronutrients uh, and, and some major nutrients into plants. They also help facilitate nutrient transfer across our colon wall. Um, the role of microbial metabolites in promoting the health of both plants and people has, has become very clear in the literature in the last few decades. It was more clear earlier in the plant world. The, the human microbiome world is sort of catching up. And the parallels, when you get into it, are actually quite striking. The other parallels are in terms of immunity and plant defense. I mean. Sure, the defense system of our bodies and the defense system of plants are different. After all, we can move around and we take nature inside of us, whereas a plant is stuck outside and can't move around in nature. Um, but the role of microbial communities and their metabolites in supporting plant defense and our own immune systems are actually strikingly parallel when you get into them. So what does this essentially mean for um, thinking about our relationship to the natural world, sort of the broader issues I advertised at the start of the talk? Well, first of all, it means that we need to think about our microbial crew or um, the microbiomes of both plants and people uh, in terms of protecting, restoring, and cultivating the beneficial microorganisms that are key elements of those communities. And in case, and that has, has clear implications for both uh, medical and agricultural practices, um, but in case you sort of want to sometime later, whether um, tonight or tomorrow, you want to convey to somebody, what is the really essence of what that crazy guy from Seattle was talking about in terms of all these microbes? Um, we've boiled the book down to six words for you, so, which should be fairly easy to remember, and that's basically mulch your soil inside and out. Um, but there's, for this audience, there's also, I think, another really big implication of the realization of the fundamental role of microbial community ecology in the health of both plants and therefore crops and, and people. And that is we really need to think about avoiding the routine use of broad spectrum biocides. Because if we basically use a broad spectrum biocide, we're taking out all the beneficial organisms as well as the pests and pathogens. And we've thought about microbes for a little over 100 years now in terms of germ theory, that there's, they're, they're bad. We need to keep them off of us. We need to sanitize our world. And we've been actually learning very recently about the science, about how that is very misguided. And that's not to say that antibiotics or even, even pesticides should never be used. But what is absolutely clear in my mind is that the idea of relying on them as our routine frontline uh, applications in both agriculture and medicine makes absolutely no sense in light of the modern science that has been revealing these intricate and highly evolved relationships between the microbial communities and the, uh, and both, and the health of plants and people. 
Um, and I'll also advertise, I guess in the next workshop, I'm gonna, I have a book that's coming out literally next week, but they have them here today. You're the first people, I think, in the country who have an opportunity to see it. Um, but it's, it's about how you apply some of these ideas in agriculture. Um, and I'll talk more about it in the, um, uh, in, the, in the workshop next, but it's called Growing a Revolution. And you can turn this kind of soil into this kind of soil, depending on how you actually farm the land. Um, and if you're into social media kind of stuff, I thought I'd just let you know how you can connect with us if you'd like. Um, uh, if you're on Twitter, we're at dig to grow and Facebook, we've switched actually to dig to grow. Um, uh, and now that we've got this next book out, but if you're interested in soil and you're interested in its relationship to human societies, the broader ecological world and how to restore soil, I'll shamelessly advertise that I now have a trilogy. I never thought I'd actually write. Um, <laughs> that talks about the role that farming practices have destroyed soils over the course of history and continue to do so under modern conventional agriculture, the nature of the microbial world in terms of what really makes for fertile soil, and then how to actually fix the problem. Because it turns out, I think, that we actually could restore fertility to the world's agricultural soils shockingly fast if we put our minds to it and completely changed our agricultural practices. And so I'd like to thank you all very much, and I encourage you to head to the next session. Hey folks, just a little uh, logistics here. I want to let everybody know that there are a number of uh, organizations that have tables out there and we uh, urge you to visit them. There's a raffle going on, so go to the front registration table for that. We have a bookstore here, so David's books as well as other authors at the forum are being sold there. Did I get everything? Yeah. and then. We have a 15 minute break, so hopefully that gives you enough time to stretch your legs and then move to the workshops. One workshop will actually be held in this auditorium, so check out your program for the other locations of the workshops. Thank you all.